What do California king snakes eat in the wild? And what does that mean for our captive care? A paper was published in 2019 and it was one of the most detailed diet studies I have read so far. The study was based on stomach contents of 2,662 museum specimens, 90 published records and 92 unpublished observations across a wide geographic range of different biotopes. So it's a massive sample size compared to any stomach contents study we've actually looked at so far on this channel. There were 447 items in total, 29% of which were mammals, 29% were snakes, 25% were lizards, 11% were birds, 4% were squamate eggs, and 1% we're an amphibian. Now we're going to go into the nitty gritty here, so for ease of use we're going to break this down into sections to dissect in detail. Rattlesnakes only amounted to 7% of the diet and 16% of total biomass and energy value. You know, it's what they're known for, it's what king snakes are known for to eat rattlesnakes, especially California king snakes. But it isn't the majority of the diet that people think it is. So it's a low percentage of the actual total diet, but what it is is that, that rattlesnakes are available throughout the entire season and they are, in terms of energy and biomass, a higher payoff item than other prey types. It is thought this is why king snakes are resistant to the venom of rattlesnakes, because this is a big ticket item in terms of calories. Not because it's the main thing they eat, but because that item, as a food item, is so valued that they evolved to capitalise on this food item. Of the 120 snakes eaten, 65% were colubrids, 24% were rattlesnakes, 7% were unidentifiable, and 4% were just straight up western blind snakes. 83 colubrid snakes were identified from the following genera. The most frequently consumed species was the gopher snake with 24 of them. This accounted for 19% of all snake prey and 4% of all total prey. Of the 130 mammalian prey consumed by California king snakes in this study, 85% of them were rodents, and 14% were unidentified mammals, and 1% was a lagomorph, which was one rabbit. So a large proportion of the diet is actually mammals, and that would make total sense when you think about how well they do in captivity on an exclusive rodent diet. There are 27 recordings of Cali King's raiding rodent nests, including those of eight voles, four deer mice, three pocket gophers, four pocket mice, four unidentified rodents, two kangaroo rats, one unidentified murid, and one chipmunk. Nest raids accounted for 24% of all rodent prey, where age class could be determined, while predation on adults accounted for the remainder. What's very interesting about this study is that even the large king snakes were eating small items frequently. They weren't exclusive to big ticket sized items. So, so when we talk about in the hobby, oh it has to be a certain size meal for a certain size of king snake, that isn't really supported by the data in this study. Now it's fine if you want to go ahead and do that, but it's also fine if you deviate from that. Things aren't as black and white as the care guides make out. You aren't going wrong by feeding smaller items one time in a feed compared to your normal large mouse, say. Now there were 111 lizards consumed by the California king snakes, encompassing 14 species in 9 genera. Of raids to actual active bird nests, 60% resulted in consumption of 1-4 nestlings, while 40% were depredations on 1-7 eggs, so they're actually taking bird eggs in their diet too, they're raiding and consuming entire clutches. Now in this study they had an estimated biomass for bird prey totaling 1,344 grams, while 61% from nestlings, 24% from eggs and 14% from fledglings. So these California king snakes are making use of the abundance of helpless Hatchlings. Of the 50 birds consumed by California king snakes, they were comprised of the following 57% Pseriforms, 23% unidentified, 14% Galliforms, and 6% Columbiforms. Now, what you'll notice here is that this is not exclusive to ground nesting species, which means these California king snakes are climbing heights to raid these birds' nests.
16 California king snakes consumed sets of squama eggs, one king snake consumed seven snake eggs, and another two consumed clutches of two eggs each. Five king snakes consumed adult lizards, including the western fence lizard, southern alligator lizard, and the madrine alligator lizard. So what's actually happening here is in terms of some of these skink species, they're actually consuming the adult that is actually protecting the eggs and then consuming the eggs as well. So for everyone in the hobby that thinks that oh you cannot feed multiple prey items, it has to be one big prey item, this is not what happens in nature. And we need to move away from this silly idea that they can only have and be fed in this one way. If you want to do that, do that. But we can't say that this is the hard set rule because this is not reality. California king snakes consumed five amphibians, including clouded tiger salamanders, a red spotted toad, and a Pacific chorus frog. Now amphibians are actually a very, very low percentage of the actual diet for them here. How I interpret this is that I not necessarily am gonna focus so much on trying to include amphibians in the diet because relatively it's a very low amount. I might just feed some frog's legs here and there very scarcely now and again as like a little extra thing after or in between two meals but I'm not desperate to include amphibians in my California king snakes diet. I'll just chuck something in now and again. Now the field observations part of this study are really interesting and like it's very easy to nerd out here but the observations and stomach contents of museum specimens confirm that California king snakes are typically diurnal and crepuscular but they're wide searching foragers. Now here they actually determined precise time of day for 26 predation events and categorized 25 others as having occurred in the daytime or nighttime. 84% of predation events took place during the day. Now this included 22 on snakes, 15 on bird nestlings or fledglings, 3 on lizards and 3 on mammals. Now this is something to pick up on here. If they're hunting and foraging in the day, then surely access to light during the day should be something we should see as like a standard thing. It's a popular trope in King Snake circles that they're fine in the dark because they occupy crevices a lot. Yes, they do, but also going out and hunting at times where there is light available is also part of their natural history. So it's far, so it makes far more sense to me anyway to give them those options and then let them choose how they want to behave around that. I wouldn't be so big headed to say, oh, I know that they won't use the light, so I'll never provide it because I know exactly what a snake's going to do. I'm sorry, but you don't. That animal is an individual and has different preferences on what it wants to do at every different part of the day. If you provide options and just let them choose, just let them get on with it. And it makes things easier for us as keepers as well, when you just make things a choice. Now I find the seasonal variation here like really interesting, so if I let you look at this graph here from the study, you can see here how the season and also the breeding cycles of other prey types influence their diet. So you can see how it's quite steady for snakes throughout the year. And then you see this boom in mammal prey when all the rodents are breeding and stuff. And you can also see that same sort of arc with the birds. When it comes into that time of year when all the birds are breeding, they're raiding all these nests more. So what you could do is you actually could look at this graph and then try and make your captive tights like it if you really wanted to nerd out that way. Personally I'm not going to go that far into it but it is interesting and this year what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed way more mammal prey when they come out of brumation, especially the females when I want to get that food into them for those follicles and of course that matches up with that spike in mammals during that time so I just find that really interesting. And this extract here that I find particularly interesting is California king snakes raid bird nests during the breeding season, often taking eggs and nestlings, but rarely fledglings. Given the wide habitat preferences of California king snakes and their ability to climb to at least 6 meters, a much larger diversity of bird species are likely eaten than are reported here. More than half of bird species consumed nest on or near the ground. Ground nesters account for more than 75% of bird prey identified to species level, and 61% of all passiforms prey were embryodized sparrows. Now what's really interesting here is the fact that they're talking about how high they can climb. So providing a couple of options of climbing 
a couple of feet in a 4x2x2 by two by two isn't something crazy and it's something that we can all do. A couple of sticks, a couple of shelves, you're allowing them to use those muscles and do behaviour that is clearly natural to them by the fact that they are raiding nests like this in the wild. The important thing that people need to take away here is that looking at natural studies doesn't mean suddenly everything has to be bioactive or it needs to be like this pristine, accurate representation of the wild. No. What we're going for here is trying to replicate the natural behaviours in the snake and that doesn't need to be natural items for them to express those natural behaviours. For example, these snakes do like crevices and will spend some time underground but they'll also forage out on the lights and they'll climb and they'll bask. So you don't have to have this pristine environment, what you could just have is an enclosure with shavings as bedding, a humid hide and a couple of sticks for them to climb and a nice little basking spot. Just thinking about what behaviours you want them to come out with. It doesn't have to look amazing bioactive, as long as the animal can actually do the things that it's supposed to do as the animal that it is. Like, your California king snake gets to be a California king snake if we just put a little bit of effort into thinking about how we want to get those natural behaviours out of them. Shavings in plastic really is all you need to get these behaviours out of them. If we put a little bit of prior planning into how we decorate our enclosures. And I just find that really fun. And as you can see from this study, there are wide generalist predators. They aren't so, oh it has to be mammal or it has to be snakes. They're so wide, widely varied that you can rotate feeders here and there. And it's not a big issue if you're rotating from day old chicks to mice and then back and forth again. They can take it, it's a king snake, they'll gobble that down. And what's also really interesting about rotating feeders is that some prey items are nutritionally higher in different nutrients than others. So by actually varying the diet, you're getting, over the long term, a greater diversity of nutrients. So it's going to be actually better for them. Now, however marginal that is, I don't know, but to me, it's worth it alongside all the enrichment aspects that come alongside that as well. So that is personally how I like to feed. Now, in terms of enrichment scenarios, you could easily give them a handful of pinkies or rat pups or quail eggs or quail chicks or, or chicks and create like a, a nesting cache for them to you know, to raid, and you will actually see these behaviours if you give them the options and enrichment opportunities to express them. And I do it, and it's actually one of the most fun ways to feed. And it's more than just adding variety and enrichment to the life, it actually saves you money. So if I'm rotating in a 13 pence day old chick rather than that £1.50 mice that week, you can see how it can bring down your feeding costs over time. It benefits your wallet and it benefits the animal. So that's why I do it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to link the study down below. It's so much more detailed than what we covered here. But then if I went into whole detail, we'd be here for hours. But go ahead and read the study. It's a really enjoyable study. It's open source. So just go read it. You may actually take some inspiration or some implications from the data in this study to influence your own care decisions that I didn't even pick up on here. So I really, really do encourage everyone to go look into the sources that I use in these videos because you can take that one step further. And it's all about empowering people to actually be able to go into and make their own decisions rather than just being spoon-fed information from care guides and stuff. So I really hope it does. this does allow people to step up their own care. Now, if you want to see all the nutritional profiles and feeders, I've done a video on that. And if you want to see more videos on wild snake diets, then go watch the videos here.